Well, good morning, and a really warm welcome to St. Paul's today, if you're here in person, and a really warm welcome if you're joining us on the live stream. It is so great to have you with us. My name is Ben, and I'm part of the team. And a great welcome from me, too, to everyone who's here and online with us. It's wonderful to be with you this morning. My name is Nell, and I'm another part of the team here. Um, just to let you know a couple of things that will be coming up during our service. We are going to have, um, to, we're going to have a video to watch um, of Ben interviewing Dominic Jewelry, who runs the language school that is one of the ministries that operates out of uh, here at St. Paul's. An amazing um, amazing ministry that blesses so many people in our community who are on the edge of it. And, um, and also we're going to have Chris preaching to us in a little while. So lots to look forward to in our service. It is half term this week, so uh, because of that, we've got a, a pack for kids that you should have got as you come in. You can enjoy that throughout the service. Uh, and just a reminder, it's so great to have uh, so many families joining us. Uh, but if you're here in person in the church, just to stay in your seats, uh, that'd be so great. And then um, there's a line two thirds of the way you might be able to see in the church. And if you come beyond that line, you will be in the live stream. So just a reminder for that. Wonderful. So, um, just one other little housekeeping thing before we get started. It's wonderful that everyone's wearing masks. That's great. We would ask that you keep them on through the service. And um, John and the team will be leading us in worship. We won't be able to sing ourselves, but let's just really sit back, at, well, stand up actually, and enjoy God's presence as we uh, listen to the worship uh, a little bit later on. So, um, if you'd like to stand with me, um, let's pray together. Mm. Father God, we thank you so much that we can meet together. Thank you that you have protected our times together and that we can be together as a family to worship you this morning. We lift you high in our hearts, in our worship, in our conversations today, and we pray that you would be working in us by your spirit as we seek your face this morning. Bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen.
presence in me, Jesus, light the way, by the power of your word, I am restored, I am redeemed, by your spirit. pray. Father, we come into your presence this morning as we enter into a, a new season with the clocks going back, as we prepare ourselves for shorter days, darker nights, colder weather, wet weather, and with the added uncertainty of that that might be ahead of us with COVID-19 and further restrictions as a result of having to self-isolate or quarantine and stop the spread of the virus. For some of us this morning, we may feel anxiety or fear. We may feel a sense of out of control. And where that's the case, Lord, I pray that you will remind us that you are in control, that we have no reason to fear when you are in control and that you love us. And for those in our community who, who don't know that, who don't know you, who don't have a hope in you, I pray that you will help us to make a difference, that you will help us as a community to reach out into those areas where you're not heard, you're not seen. May we be your voice 
may we present your love. May we be Jesus to those that we know and those around us. Give us the opportunities, Lord, to share your love, to share our hope and to share you. And Lord, we also recognize that as we move into November, we have also come out of Black History Month in October. And this is also in the context of the things, the lessons we have learned through Black Lives Matter, where we realize that as a society, we have shortcomings. We have failed huge parts of our society. We have people who are hurting. We have generations where there is pain, where there is mistrust, where there is anger. People feel let down. Where we have been a part of that, we, we say sorry. And we ask that you will help us to understand where we can make changes, how we can right the wrongs, how we can change our society, how we can be part of a, a new future where we recognize and understand that these things can't continue and that they're not of you, that you see each one of us as equals. And Lord, we pray that we don't just see those around us as equals, but we see those around us as brothers and sisters in you, that they are loved by you. Help us to have your eyes. Help us to see people with, with your heart. And lastly, Lord, I also just pray for our planet. I pray for our, our environment that we live in and for the way in which we have seemingly just taken advantage of the good things that you've given us and as a as a world we have we have ruined the place in that we live the place that we call home where all of these issues whether it be the coronavirus or the racial inequality or environmental issues where these are huge topics that we feel out of control and we feel that there isn't much we can do i pray that you stir within us something of you that will help us to make a difference, Lord. I pray for restoration, I pray for healing, and I pray for your love. Amen. Thank you so much, Nick. Please do take a seat. So we are going to watch a short interview now. Um, it's, it's a great, I watched it in the 915 service. I really enjoyed learning more about um, the St. Paul's Language School. In other, words, in other ways, I guess really isolated in our community who are really struggling um, and so helping them with their English. So here's Ben and Dom Jory on our screens uh, and let's sit back and enjoy this video. Well, thanks so much for joining me today, Dom. Why don't you just tell us to start off with, what is the Language School? So, Ealing Community School of English is a ministry of St. Paul's Church here, and uh, we run two evenings a week, a Monday and a Wednesday evening at uh, Elthorne Park High School. Um, we run English language classes, conversational English language classes. We have six levels this year, and we have approximately 50 students come uh, every evening this year. And I know you personally lead the language school um, and you give so much time into it. For you, uh, why do you do that? What excites you? Why, why are you passionate about this ministry? It's great to you know, break down linguistic and cultural barriers that are, that are put up uh, by not, having, not being able to speak English. People can't communicate. Mm. Um, they have a sense of isolation, a sense of loneliness. Uh, they're misunderstood sometimes, so it's, and they have just difficulty, you know, surviving in, in healing. So it's, it's good to break those, those barriers down. Can you give an example of how um, people's lives have changed because uh, of coming on the, the school? I, I remember we had a, a lady called um, Agnieszka who was from Poland, and she had two young children who were about four and six, and they were just going through that phase where they were starting school, starting nursery and they were getting ill every, every week. And um, Agnieszka didn't have the confidence in her language ability to be able to speak to the doctor in, mm. in Ealing, so she used to fly home to Poland whenever the children got ill. Um, 
and, and that was impacting her you know, financially and, and just her you know, structure of, of living in the UK. So, um, so she, she was learning English and I bumped into her in, in Northfield surgery, she's obviously in the doctors, but it was great to see her having the confidence to be able to speak to the doctor and not having to fly back to Poland when, uh, when her children were ill. So yeah, that, 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 that obviously mixed emotions, she was in the surgery, but, uh, <laughs> but it was great that she, she was in the surgery, she had the confidence to speak to her doctor. That is so great to hear. Um, I guess all of us have been impacted recently through the pandemic. How have the guests at the language school been impacted? Um, they've been impacted quite badly. A lot of them work in the hospitality industry, catering industry, and so they have been, a lot of them have been made unemployed. Um, a lot of them live in quite isolated lives. They may live in a shared, in a room, in a shared house with no communal space, so there's no interaction. Uh, you know, by definition, they're a long, long way from home, so they don't have the support infrastructure around them. So they've been sort of quite lonely and isolated. Mm. And, and on top of that, they, you know, they're losing their, their, they've lost their job, so that they've lost that human interaction, that connection, and that structure. Such a challenging time, but it's great to hear the language school is still running. Um, I wonder, just finally, what could we pray for for the language school this term? Uh, pray for our volunteers. We've got about 16 volunteers. Um, they're highly skilled. They give up uh, one evening a week to, to teach. Uh, we like consistency with our volunteers. So we ask them to commit to the whole academic year. Um, they also, you know, they're professionals. They, they prepare lessons. So they give about four hours a week um, to mm. the school. Um, and uh, they, you know, they're very professional. I feel very blessed to have them at the school. So pray for our volunteers and, and pray for our students. You know, as I said, a lot are, um, are, are struggling during this pandemic through, through financially, through lack of human interaction, through isolation. Mm -hmm. So pray for our, our students as well. well. Why don't we pray for the language school now? Uh, Father, we thank you so much for this incredible ministry. Thank you for the lives that have changed through this, through Dom and his team. And we pray for your blessing upon it uh, for the teachers and students this year. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank, Thank you ben. so much for joining me. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, the Language School really is an amazing ministry, so do be remembering uh, that school in your prayers going forward. Uh, we're just now going to take a moment to let you know a few things that are going on in the life of the church. And uh, I guess this is especially relevant for those who are watching on the live stream. Uh, so after the service this morning, there'll be an opportunity to receive some prayer ministry. If there's something in your life that you'd like someone to pray with you about, or maybe something in Chris's talk comes up that you'd like to respond to, uh, you can click on the link on the homepage of the website, and there'll be people there who would love to pray with you. And also, there's an opportunity to join with others for a Zoom coffee time straight after the service, and Tim and Lucy Radcliffe will be hosting that. That's great, and uh, don't feel you just have to be at home to do that, because I have known people to log in to the coffee call on the bus on the way home, so uh, please feel free to join in wherever you are. Anyway, um, just um, coming up on Tuesday night, we have Hungary. Hungary is a great opportunity uh, just for worship and prayer. That's all it is, worship and prayer, a uh, time to meet with God. And uh, we'll be meeting on Zoom this week, online hosted by Mark Mellowish. Uh, from 8 o'clock to 8.45 p.m. You can find the link for that on our website. So please do join in if you're free on Tuesday evening. Uh, and just to say, if you're new or perhaps visiting us for the first time, we'd love to say hello and give you a welcome pack. Uh, there's a bit of information there about uh, the life of the church, our vision and values, and also a chocolate bar, which is always a good thing. Um, and uh, we'd love to encourage you to sign up for communication uh, we can't fill out welcome cards at the moment, which is our normal practice, uh, but you can go on the website, on the homepage, there's a little uh, box that says contact us. You can fill in your details and receive our weekly mail out and communication from the church. And if you've not yet done that, you're watching on the live stream or in person, then can I encourage you to do that? So John is now going to lead us in a family song. Now, you may have noticed that Tamlin is um, having a well-deserved holiday this week. And imagine my surprise when we were planning the service and Ben said, Chris has volunteered to do the actions for the song. So a half-term treat for us all. Here's Chris leading the actions. Please join him. <laughs>
I think the words stitch and up come to mind. Uh, do stand up where you are. And if you're watching live, you better be joining in with the actions for this as well. Uh, because I think it's good fun to do. Uh, so let's worship together. John. Here we go. Shine from the inside out that the world will see you live in me. Shine Woo! from the inside out that the world will see you live in me because you know me. You love me, you feel me, so sell me, you know me, you love me, you feel me, so sell me to shine Woo! from the inside out, that the world will see you live in me. Oh, shine Woo! from the inside out, that the world will see you. He's gonna try and sit down before the next one, just you guys. One, two, three, one! Numbers to me, numbers to me, numbers to me, numbers to me. Numbers to me to shine. From the inside out, that the world will see you live in me. You shine. From the inside out, that the world will see you. Thank you, John, for leading us in our family worship. And just to let you know that if you've got children, uh, there are, uh, there's a great kind of online service that takes place. You can pick it up on YouTube and also our youth activities. Each week we host groups for young people. You can sign up for the Sunday sessions in the afternoon uh, via the website for more information about youth stuff. Do contact Lizzie or for children's stuff. Do contact Tamlin. And we're now going to have our reading, which Felix Ajay is going to come and bring us. And then I'm going to come back up and speak. Morning. So the readings from the book of John. The readings from the book of John, chapter 4. I'm going to read from 4 to um, 26. Now, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground where Jacob um, had given his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman, how can you ask me for a drink? Because the Jews are not associated with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he'd give you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw. He 
his livestock. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will never thirst again and I will have to come here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said, you are right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you have had five husbands and the man that you're with right now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. The worship, but we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. For when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Thank you. Um, it's great to be with you this morning. Uh, thanks for joining us and welcome online. If you're watching us live streamed in your pajamas with your coffee, I hope you are singing along to all the songs. Uh, but for those of you who have come this morning in person, you have treasure in heaven. So it's great you're here. Am I allowed to say that? No. Okay. Well, never mind. I already have and it's recorded. Um, one of the things that I love to hear, one of the privileges I have as a pastor, but is, is, and I also love asking questions, is, is, is hearing the stories that people have of how God has transformed or brought change to people, to their lives. And uh, we started a new life group, or we were part of a new life group that began a few weeks ago with a few people, and uh, we've been on Zoom, and one of the things we've done is just to share some stories. What's God been doing? What's our story of faith? How did we find Jesus? And, and to hear those stories has been just remarkably encouraging. I don't know about you, but I love to hear the stories of the faith from other people. And it inspires my faith. It grows me. It makes me uh, kind of encouraged, as it were. And, um, you know, I've also get emails from some of you when you've shared some of the stories. You've emailed stories at stpaulsealing.com. I'm one of the emails it comes to because I love to get those emails. And I got some this week that are super encouraging and inspiring. And hopefully in the future we'll be able to share some of those with you because it builds our faith. Stories are how we encourage one another. And we're doing a little series at the minute um, in the mornings from, John, uh, from, the, from the Gospels where we're thinking about conversations with Jesus. Um, I don't know about you, but sometimes I, I, um, my faith it gets challenged really because I realize that Jesus, the, the, the idea of who I think Jesus is, is a little bit like me. I think that Jesus agrees with everything I agree with. He disagrees with everything I disagree with. He cares about the things I care about. And obviously I don't ever feel challenged by Jesus because he agrees with me. And when that happened, I don't know if any of you would ever relate to that. But if you find you, actually that's the case and maybe Jesus has become a little bit more in your own image rather than in the image of, of, of God, then maybe it's worth heading to the Gospels. I find that super encouraging and and challenging. I remember when I first read the Gospels, when I became a Christian, I read Matthew's Gospel and John's Gospel um, quite quickly and early on. And honestly, I was both shocked, challenged, and excited about being a Christian all in the same moment. And sometimes we can lose sight of the, the radical nature, the amazing person that Jesus is. And so doing this little series on conversations with Jesus, we're positioning ourselves, as it were, to, to listen in to some key encounters in the Gospels. I don't know if you ever sit in a cafe and, and suddenly you realise that the 
people next to you, the family, the couple, uh, the, the work colleagues next to you are having a really fascinating conversation. And, and the conversation at your table grows a little quieter as all of you lean slightly that way just to catch what's going on. Has anyone ever done that? Okay, just you, none of you at the back have put your hands up on the live streams. So that's okay. Yeah, but I definitely have. It's, it's one of those things. We get to do that with these conversations. We get to listen in uh, to what happens in these moments. And, and this morning, we're looking together at one of the longest conversations with Jesus in the Bible, which is between the woman at the well and Jesus. Um, so let's uh, pray as we look more at that passage. Lord, I pray this morning that we would hear your voice we'd hear you speak to us, just as we listen into this conversation, that actually we'd hear you speak into our lives. And Lord, we'd learn what, who you are, and we'd learn what you would want to say and do with us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So just to recap the story, Jesus and the disciples are heading from Judea, which is just north of Jerusalem, back to Galilee, which is in the north of Israel, or in Palestine. And um, to get to that point, not you would the shortest route is through Samaria. So often Jews would, would kind of do a big bypass or a detour of Samaria to get to um, Galilee. And that would take quite probably about a day longer than it would normally. But Jesus isn't worried about that. He wants to go straight through Samaria. I'd imagine reluctant disciples following him. And as is so often in the, in the stories of Jesus is something significant happens on the journey on the way as he is walking. And Jesus comes to a town called Sychar, which is in Samaria, and he meets at the, in the middle of the day uh, this woman. Um, and the remarkable nature of this encounter is found in the detail uh, of the story. So let's just have a look at that a little bit now. Number one, the first thing to highlight from this story is that this is a scandalous conversation. There's so much about this that is not appropriate for that culture at that time. Um, and, but we see that in the Gospels. Jesus takes great delight in dismantling religious or societal barriers that stop people getting to God or that divide people from each other. The greatest commandment is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and to love our neighbour as ourselves. Anything that gets in the way of those two things, Jesus will take it down because he wants everyone to be able to get to God because we're all invited and welcome. And he wants to build, um, you know, rebuild love for neighbor. And so he takes it down. He does it all the time. He, you know, lep those who had leprosy, uh, he would touch them to heal them. He wasn't fearful of catching something. He was, he was keen to give them the life that he had. Um, whether it's welcoming children who definitely should be not seen or heard in that culture. Welcoming tax collectors, those who'd made their, their money, their income off the backs of other people. What about challenging those in power, whether that's Pilate or Herod or whoever it might be. Jesus was happy to dismantle religious and societal barriers. And in this conversation, he takes down a whole bunch of things. Let me just give you a little bit of context. Firstly, the first barrier that Jesus takes down is, is, is a racial and religious barrier. She is a Samaritan. The Samaritans and the Jews had about 500 years worth of hostility between them. They hated each other. Um, the Samaritans uh, were effectively a tribe that formed as a result of the Jews who didn't go into exile. When the Babylonians uh, came and ransacked Jerusalem and took uh, most of the Jewish people out of Israel, the, the Jews that stayed, many of them uh, married local Canaanite people, people from other tribes, uh, and the Samaritans were the sort of uh, the group that formed from that. And they merged and blended their cultural and religious practices and created this sort of blended version of the Jewish faith which, with, with faith, which would have been familiar, but different. And therefore, the Jewish people sort of rejected that entirely. And Jesus walked across this racial and religious divide. And, and I just want to say something here about breaking down barriers when it comes to racial justice. Uh, we're at the end of Black History Month, as Nick really helpfully reminded us in our prayers. Um, for me, I, I can only talk personally, but for me, this has been a season of listening to the stories of black people and their experiences of racial injustice, not just in the last month, but over the last uh, several months. Having conversations with people who are part of St. Paul's and, and friends of mine who are in other contexts. Conversations that I've, some of you may have seen some of them on social media or ones that many that I've more that I've had privately. It's just been a time to listen and to learn. 
to cross a divide that maybe I wouldn't have thought to cross before. Not just to be, I don't think I'm racist, but to try in some way to learn to be a bit more anti-racist. And I know it's a, con uh, it's, it's a, it's a complex uh, situation, but actually for me, it's an important one to engage with and learn. And, you know, and this conversation here reminds us that Jesus crossed that racial divide. And, and the key thing is this, that through this conversation, Jesus saw a, helped a marginalized woman find life and faith. And through that marginalized woman, helped a marginalized community find life and faith. And so for me, maybe a willingness just to listen and learn, that's been the helpful thing for me. And, and you know, I'd love to encourage us to do that to listen and learn, to cross those divides, to, to step into the lives of others and to listen to their experiences and their stories, whatever that might be. And it's a long learning process, but an important one that I found to engage with. Jesus crosses the racial and religious boundaries. He pulls them down. He's not interested in those. They're for him something to be walked through. The next one is that he, crosses, he breaks down the barrier of gender. She is a woman. In fact, she is really shocked that he would even ask her for a drink of water. Um, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. What are you doing? Why are you breaking this important boundary? She is shocked that he would do that. But the lovely thing about Jesus is he has no concern for his own reputation. People can say what they like about him. He just wants to do the right thing. I find that immensely challenging. He's happy to be known as a friend of sinners and tax collectors. I wonder how we are with that. He breaks down the gender barrier and then the societal barrier. She is an outsider in her own community. How do we know that? She's, she's drawing water at midday. You don't draw water at midday in a desert. It's nearly 50 degrees. It's unbearably hot. She's on her own. She's had to drag a heavy water carrier up to that, that well out of the town to get water. And the, the other women would have done it at the beginning of the day or maybe the end of the day, and they would have supported and helped each other. She is on her own. You know, I wonder why she's not welcome. I think we get a hint of that later in the conversation. So this is a scandalous conversation, and I think it's really important that we understand that because it helps us to see what Jesus, and therefore what God is willing to do to spend time with each of us. I don't know where we would put ourselves in this story. I love to imagine what Jesus would do, and, and, the, and the unease of this woman is, why is this Jewish man, this Jewish rabbi talking to me? And then Jesus begins the conversation. He initiates it. A bit like God, really, isn't it? God is the one who initiates stuff with us you know we don't find Jesus he finds us we, we everything every prayer we pray is a response to God uh, inviting us into relationship he takes the initiative and so Jesus just says this I'm thirsty will you give me a drink this is a conversation all about water in a desert at noon with near 50 degree heat as I've said and Jesus has a physical thirst I've been to the Sahara Desert I've been uh, in a salt lake uh, in Tunisia, uh, on the edge of the Sahara Desert, I remember in the middle of the day doing field work in my geography degree, and I promise you, it is not a pleasant experience. Um, not the geography degree, the desert moment. I quite enjoyed my geography degree. But, you know, when you feel thirsty then, it, it just is, it, it, the heat exacerbates it. You become just, I am desperate for something to drink, even though I probably had something about half an hour ago. Imagine having walked in that heat and really needing something to drink. That's the thirst that Jesus had. And actually, when he asks for that physically, it, it draws out of her her need for something spiritual. She's probably had a drink. She's physically, she's feeling fine. But actually, in her life, there's something even deeper. And Jesus says, you know, that spiritual thirst is as important as your, as your physical thirst. If you don't satisfy the spiritual thirst with living water, you're always going to be thirsty. Isn't that true in our lives sometimes? We just know that deep longing for peace, for, uh, for kind of a, a confidence and, a, and, a, and a, a contentment that sometimes we so lack. And I know that for many of us, we would call ourselves followers of Jesus. Many of us who are watching would do. Maybe some of, not all of us, but we would call ourselves followers of Jesus. And even we find that sometimes. 
we find that we just long for that peace and contentment that can only come from this living water that Jesus offers. Jesus is saying that this spiritual living water is as important for us as the physical water we drink. And he says to her, if you only knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for this living water. This living water that will well up within you. Uh, and the, the phrase well up, we understand that, you know, coming to the surface. But actually, it, it more, a better translation would be jumped up. And the picture here is of resurrection, is that this living water, the presence of God, the Spirit of God living within us, will bring resurrection life, will bring us back to life, will, will, will bring hope in the midst of despair. And I would imagine for her, as we learn about her story, isn't that where she finds herself? On her own, getting water, having a conversation with a strange man in the middle of the day. What's life like for her? And Jesus says, well, there's living water for you that will well up, that will jump up and bring you to life. And is it any wonder then her response is, I want some of that. Give that to me. You know, when we discover life in its fullness, we long for it. We want it. We see it. Give it to me. I want what you've got. It's a great prayer to pray. Jesus, give me the living water that you're offering. So the first thing is about living water. The second thing is a question around the presence of God. As, as she asks Jesus for water, Jesus then seems to change the subject and point and ask her, well, go and get your husband. It's a bit of a change, isn't it? And then she says, well, actually, I don't have a husband, which is true. But Jesus says, you know, actually, you've had five husbands and the man you're currently living with, he's not your husband. I mean, wow, talk about getting to the heart of the matter. Jesus draws out of her the complex, the complex brokenness that she has battled with all of her life. We don't know why this has happened, but there are a few things we can know. Number one is any kind of, you can't, a, a woman couldn't divorce a man in that culture. So she has been divorced five times. Men have kicked her out effectively five times. That, what that does to us in terms of relational and emotional trauma must be significant. That level of rejection. In a patriarchal society, she has nothing. So she has to do whatever she can in order to survive, which means moving in with another man, probably someone else's husband, so that she can just make, make life survive. And do you know, at no point Jesus can, does, does Jesus condemn that adultery. It's interesting that, isn't it? Why? Because he understands, he listens. It's not that it's right, but it's complex, and life is complex. And sometimes we're so quick to be black and white on things, but actually life is complex. Jesus, in this moment, draws out the real story behind her spiritual thirst. Is that I think maybe she's hoped that she'd find that in relationships, that maybe someone will just love me for who I am. And time and time again, she's been let down. And Jesus is saying, do you know what? I won't let you down. I've got living water for you. The woman then changes the subject again, I think understandably. But actually, I also think these two questions, these two conversations are connected. The story of her broken past and the question around worship. It's really interesting. I think she's saying, well, you know, you Jews say we have to worship in a temple and we say we can worship on the mountain and what's that about? I think there are two questions she's asking Jesus here. Number one is, is, is God near? In other words, is God present on our mountain? Is God present in this moment? Do you think God would even come near to us Samaritans? Because if the narrative is for 500 years, the Jews have told them that they're a second-rate nation, you kind of live under that, don't you? Is God even present here? And then I think the question underlying that is, and is God even with me? Could I, even me, meet with God? And do you know the answer to both those questions that Jesus gives is yes. There's a time coming we don't worry about the temple. That's scandalous to the Jews. Don't worry about your mountain. Well, he's offended the Jews and the Samaritans. He's, just, he's knocked them both out. And he said, because there's a time coming where you don't need to worry about where you are because God will be with you. Imagine for that. Well, I don't reckon anyone has ever said to that woman that God is with her until Jesus turns up. God is with you. And do you know what? Even you can worship him. Even you are welcome with him. And she goes, yeah, yeah, no, I know that. When the Messiah comes, that's all going to happen. And Jesus says, well, I am he. 
Imagine Moses in the desert. He thinks God has abandoned him. Who is it that talks to me? I am who I am. Jesus just reveals to her who he is. And you know in the gospel stories, she's the first person that gets to hear from the mouth of Jesus who he really is. Not the disciples, not the high priest, not Pilate, not Herod, not anyone else, not even his family, but the woman at the well. What an amazing conversation we've got to listen to. She is probably the last person you'd imagine that Jesus would speak to in that way. But she is the person who gets to hear who he is. In, the, in that moment, she discovers that God is not only present, but that she can draw as close as she can. There was no social distancing. They were sat near to each other. They were in, she was in the very presence of God himself. What about for us? What might God be saying to us through this conversation? I've just got four things, literally four sentences that I want to leave us with before we pray. Number one, the only place to find living water is Jesus. Everything else will promise much, but will never quite deliver it. We will never find satisfaction for our souls in our work, in our relationships. However good they are, they are good gifts, but they will never replace the presence of God in the midst of our lives. And he offers living water to us all today. Number two is that God is very near to us, even when we least expect it. And I would suggest the further we feel from God, the closer he is to us. The psalmist said, David says, where can I go from your presence? In the heights and the depths, you're just there. I cannot get away from you. God is nearer than we think. The third thing is this, I want to ask us the question, are we willing to put ourselves, as Jesus did, in an uncomfortable situation with people we wouldn't normally associate or spend time with, because actually that, from those conversations, life can come. Maybe for us, it's the issue of racial justice. We put ourselves in a place to listen, to hear, to understand better, and to do something about a crucial issue of kingdom justice in our world. And finally, have we got a story of faith that we can share with someone this week? It might be our story of faith, how we became followers of Jesus. It might be something that God has done in our lives recently. We don't kind of have to sort of, it doesn't have to be, you know, all singing or dancing. It's just what God's been doing. It's the reality of life, of meeting God in everyday life. Just as I began with hearing the stories of those in our life group, you know, all of us have stories of faith. I'd love to hear them. Maybe we can share them with someone and help someone else discover life in all of its fullness. You know, for this woman, she was transformed. For that, through that woman, a community was transformed from a simple conversation. I want to finish with this. Jesus says twice in John's Gospel that he's thirsty. This is the first moment, 50 degree heat, noon in the desert. The second moment, is on the cross. I thirst. In other words, for the thirst of humanity to be satisfied, it meant that Jesus had to go to the cross. He gave his life for us, the ultimate demonstration of love. This is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. The free gift offered to each one. And you know, whether we're watching online or here in the room, um, that free gift is offered to us today. So I'm just going to ask us to stand and I want to pray Pray that we would know the living water, we'd be filled with that living water that would jump up within us to bring resurrection life. But also for those of us who spiritually recognise we've got a deep, hung, a deep thirst. And maybe for the first time we want to say yes to following Jesus. Jesus, just as he had the conversation with the woman then, invites us into relationship with him now. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your presence. I want to thank you for your love for us. I want to pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. I want to pray for living water. For every person in the room, from the youngest to the oldest, fill us with your Holy Spirit. For every person watching online, I want to pray, Lord, that you would bring life. For those who feel like they've constantly been rejected. Lord, we, you would remind them of their value and worth. 
come Holy Spirit. And I would just love everyone in the room to close their eyes, if that's okay. And if today you're saying for the first time, I want to follow Jesus, this is my decision, my walk with my faith, I want it to be my own. The reason for asking everyone to close their eyes is I'd love you just to raise your hand. I don't mind if you're five or 105. If you want to say yes to following Jesus, I'd love you to raise your hand. And if you're at home watching this, just place your hand on your heart and say, this is my time to say yes to following him. Well, Father, would you bless us? Would you keep us? Would you draw us to yourself? We're going to worship, and as, we, as this song is sung, we, we might not be able to sing, but we can absolutely worship. Then why don't we just ask God to speak to us, to fill us with that living water? And maybe we've got stuff that we'd love someone to pray for, and as I said, we can access that, particularly if you're online at the moment, you can access prayer ministry after the service is finished. Um, we're going to worship, and then Ben and Nell are going to pray for us as we come into land.
as we be just one word and darkness flees just one word defeats the enemy just one word brings victory when you speak Jesus we to the end of our service now. Thank you so much for joining us here in church and online. It's been wonderful to be with you this morning. I really pray that you've had an opportunity to meet with God in some way during the service today. Um, there's just a couple of things to remind us. Well, first of all, obviously, to remind us that if you would um, like someone to pray for you, then there is the Zoom call that you can log into as soon as we're finished here. Um, and Sheena Burrow will be hosting that, and there'll be people waiting to pray for those who would like to receive some prayer this morning. And obviously, we've got the coffee call as well, um, also starting with Tim and Lucy Radcliffe hosting it. So please feel free to join in with that wherever you are, even if it's on the bus. <laughs> And I think, Ben, you're going to pray for us now, aren't you? Let's pray as we draw our service to a close. Father, thank you for your presence with us, whether we're in the building or watching on the live stream. Thank you that you are near. And we pray that you'd fill us with your spirit, that we might reflect you this week and all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again really soon. Thank you.